Chapter 5. Planning in India. For the first eight plans the emphasis was on a growing public sector with massive investments in basic and heavy industries, but since the launch of the ninth plan in 1997, the emphasis on the public sector has become less pronounced and the current thinking on planning in the country, in general, is that it should increasingly be of an indicative nature. Asterisk. In this chapter. Diamond Suit Introduction Diamond Suit Background Diamond Suit Major Objectives of Planning Diamond Suit Planning Commission Diamond Suit National Development Council Diamond Suit Central Planning Diamond Suit Multi-Level Planning Diamond Suit Way to Decentralize Planning Diamond Suit The Planning Commission and the Finance Commission Diamond Suit A Critical Evaluation Diamond Suit Inclusive Growth Diamond Suit Resource Mobilization Diamond Suit Investment Models Diamond Suit Central Sector Schemes and Centrally Sponsored Schemes Diamond Suit Independent Evaluation Office Diamond Suit Program Evaluation Organization Diamond Suit Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office Diamond Suit Nitty IOG Diamond Suit Major Documents of the Nitty Diamond Suit Nitty Performs Introduction It was the Soviet Union which explored and adopted national planning for the first time in the world. After a prolonged period of debate and discussion, the first Soviet plan commenced in 1928 for a period of five years. But the world outside was not fully aware of the modus operandi of development planning till the 1930s. It was the exodus of the East European economists too. Britain and the United States in the 1920s and 1930s that made the world aware as to what economic national planning was all about. The whole lot of colonial world and the democracies of the time were fascinated by the idea of planning as an instrument of economic progress. The nationalist leaders with socialistic inclination of the erstwhile British colonies were more influenced by the idea of economic planning. The whole decade of the 1930s is the period in the one. Indian history when we see nationalists, capitalists, socialists, democrats and academicians advocating for the need of economic planning in India at one point or the other. Independent India was thus destined to be a planned economy. The economic history of India too is nothing but the history of planning. Even if the so-called economic reforms started in 1991-92, all the humble suggestions regarding the contours of reforms were very much outlined by the Planning Commission by then. Once the reforms commenced, the think tank started outlining the major future direction for further plans. Going through the history of planning in India is a highly educational trip in itself, for though the Planning Commission has been a political body, it never hesitated in pointing out good economics time and again. Let us therefore look into the unfolding of the planning process in India. 3-4-5 Background By the decade of the 1930s, the idea of planning had already entered the domain of intellectual and political discussion in India. Many fresh proposals suggesting immediacy of planning in India were put forward, though the erstwhile British government remained almost immune to them. But these humble proposals of planning served their purpose once India became independent and decided to adopt a planned economy. The Vishwashvaraya Plan The credit of proposing the first blueprint of Indian planning is given to the popular civil engineer and the ex dewan of the Mysore state, M. Vishwashvaraya. In his book The Planned Economy of India, published in 1934, he outlined the broad contours of his plan proposal. His ideas of state planning were an exercise in democratic capitalism, similar to the USA, with emphasis on industrialization, a shift of labor from agricultural to industries, targeting to double the national income in one decade. Though there was no follow-up by the British government on this plan, it aroused an urge for national planning among the educated citizens of the country. 6. The Fitchy Proposal In 1934, a serious need of national planning was recommended by the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry Fitchy, the leading organization of Indian capitalists. Its President N. R. Sarkar proclaimed that the days of undiluted laissez-faire were gone forever and for a backward country like India, a comprehensive plan for economic development covering the whole gamut of economic activities was a necessity. 
Voicing the views of the capitalist class, he further called for a high-powered, national planning commission, to coordinate the whole process of planning so that the country could make a structural break with the past and achieve its full growth potential. By the late 19th century, the economic thinking of the nationalists such as M.G. 7. Renata and Databai Naroji, was in favor of a dominant role of the state in the economy and doubted the prudence of the, market mechanism. This thinking was further reinforced by the Keynesian ideas in the wake of the Great Depression, the New Deal in the USA and the Soviet experiment in national planning. Thus, the Indian capitalist class were also influenced by these events which were voiced in the Fitchy articulation for planning. The Congress Plan Though the Gandhians and some of the business and propertied representatives were opposed to commit the party to centralized state planning, including Mahatma Gandhi, it was on the initiative of the INC President Subhash C. Bose that the National Planning Committee, NPC, was set up in October 1938 under the chairmanship of J. L. Nehru to work out concrete programs for development encompassing all major areas of the economy. Basically, the NPC was set up in a conference of the ministers of industries of the Congress ruled states though other states were also invited to participate where M. Vishwashvaraya, J. R. D. Tata, G. D. Birla and Lala Sri Ram and many others including academicians, technocrats, provincial civil servants, trade unionists, socialists and communists, etc. were also invited. The 15-member NPC with 29 subcommittees and a total of 350 members produced 29 volumes of recommendations. The work of the committee was interrupted when the Second World War broke out and in the wake of the Quit India movement many of its members including the chairman were arrested, and between 1940 and 1945 the committee had only a nominal existence. Though the final report of the NPC could only be published in 1949, many developments related to planning took place 8-9-10 during the interim government up to 1946. A series of valuable reports were published which brought together the constructive thinking done by the committee and the subcommittees and the materials collected in the course of their work. The importance of the NPC lies not so much in these reports as in the wide interest it created throughout the country for coordinated planning as the only means of bringing about a rapid increase in the standards of living and its emphasis on the need for bringing fundamental changes in the social and economic structure. Quote. Some of the important developments after the NPC was set up which prepared a Foundation 11 for coordinated planning in independent India are given below. I post-war reconstruction committee. Early in June 1941, the Government of India formed, on popular demand, a post-war reconstruction committee which was to consider various plans for the reconstruction of the economy. 12. E. Consultative Committee of Economists A consultative committee of economists under the chairmanship of Ramaswamy Mudalir was set up in 1941 as a think tank to advise the four post-war reconstruction committees for executing national plan for the country. Though the committee suggested many plans for different areas of the economy, they had negligible practical significance as these suggestions were imbued with academic biases. E. Planning and Development Department. After all possible delays, it was in 1944 that the government created a planning and development department under a separate member of the Viceroy's Executive Council for organizing and coordinating economic planning in the country. Ardashir Dalal, the controller of the Bombay Plan, was appointed as one of its acting members. More than 20 panels of experts were set up. The central departments and the governments of the provinces and Indian states were invited to prepare detailed plans for industrialization. Point one two. This department was abolished in 1946. IV Advisory Planning Board. In October 1946, the Government of India appointed a committee called the Advisory Planning Board, 13 to review the planning that had already been done by the British government, the work of the National Planning Committee, and other plans and proposals for planning and to make recommendations. Regarding the future machinery of planning and also in regard to objectives and priorities. The board strongly recommended the creation of a single, compact authoritative organization. Dot, dot, responsible directly to the cabinet. Dot, dot. 
which should devote its attention continuously to the whole field of development. This was an emphatic advice for the creation of a National Planning Commission, similar to FICCI's view of 1934, which will have autonomy and authoritative say on the process of development planning, working in tandem with the Union Cabinet and also influencing the developmental decisions of the states. This happened in 1950 with the setting up of the Planning Commission. 14. The board, in its report of January 1947, emphatically expressed the opinion that the proper 15 development of large-scale industries can only take place if political units, whether in the provinces or states, agree to work in accordance with a common plan. This suggestion worked as a great influence on the planning process of independent India as it always tried to give unifying nature to development planning. But, this process also induced a serious tendency of centralization in the Indian planning to which a number of states were to pose objections and straining the center-state relations, time and again. However, the political leadership, right from the 1920s, was very conscious of the need for decentralized planning in the country. 1617. The Bombay Plan. The Bombay Plan was the popular title of, A Plan of Economic Development for India, which was prepared by a cross-section of India's leading capitalists. The eight capitalists involved in this plan were Prashotamdas the Kurdas, J. R. D. Tata, G. D. Birla, Lala Shri Ram, Kasturbai, Lalbai, A. D. Shroff, Avdashir Dalal and John Matai. The plan was published in 1944-45. Out of these eight industrialists, Prashotamdas the Kurdas was one among the 15 members of the National Planning Committee, 1938-1819-J. R. D. Tata, G. D. Birla and Lala Shri Ram, were 20 members of the subcommittees, 29 in total, of the National Planning Committee. The popular sentiments regarding the need of planning and criss-cross of memberships between the NPC and the Bombay Plan Club made possible some clear-cut agreements between these two major plans, which ultimately went to mold the very shape of the Indian economy after independence. We may have a look at some of the very important agreements, I, a basic agreement on the issue of the agrarian restructuring, abolition of all intermediaries, I, E. Zamindari abolition, minimum wages, guarantee of minimum or fair prices for agricultural products, cooperatives, credit and marketing supports. 21. E. Agreement on rapid industrialization for which both the plans agreed upon an emphasis on heavy capital goods and basic industries. The Bombay plan had allocated 35% of its total plan outlay on basic industries. E. Taking clues from the Soviet planning, the NPC and the Bombay plan both were in favor of a simultaneous development of the essential consumer goods industries, but as a low-key affair. I. V. Both the plans agreed upon the importance of promoting the medium scale, small scale and cottage industries as they could provide greater employment and require lesser capital and lower order of plants and machineries. B. Both the plans wanted the state to play an active role in the economy through planning, controlling and overseeing the different areas of the economy, i. e. trade, industry and banking, through state ownership, public sector, or through direct and extensive control over them. B. Large-scale measures for social welfare were favored by both the plans, which suggested to be based on issues like, right to work and full employment, the guarantee of a minimum wage, greater state expenditure on housing, water and sanitation, free education, social insurance to cover unemployment and sickness and provision of utility services such as electricity and transportation at a low cost through state subsidies. B. Both the plans agreed upon a planning which could do away with gross inequalities. Through measures like progressive taxation and prevention of concentration of wealth. Inequality was considered undesirable as it tended to restrict the domestic market. The Gandhian Plan. Espousing the spirit of the Gandhian economic thinking, Sriman Narayan Agarwal formulated. The Gandhian Plan in 1944. The plan laid more emphasis on agriculture. Even if he referred to industrialization, it was to the level of promoting cottage and village level industries, unlike the NPC and the Bombay plan which supported a leading role for the heavy and large industries.
The plan articulated a decentralized economic structure for India with self-contained villages. It needs to be noted here that the Gandhians did not agree with the views of the NPC or the Bombay plan, particularly on issues like centralized planning, dominant role of the state in the economy and the emphasis on industrialization being the major ones. For Gandhi, the machinery, commercialization and centralized state power were the curses of modern civilization, thrust upon the Indian people by European colonialism. It was industrialism itself, Gandhi argued, rather than the inability to industrialize, which was the root cause of Indian poverty. This was until the 1940s that the Congress supported the above-given view of Gandhi to mobilize a mass movement against the colonial rule. But it was in the NPC that the Congress tried to articulate a different view on these issues, almost taking a break from Gandhi's ideas. The very first session of the NPC was brought to an impasse by J. C. Kumarapa, the lone Gandhian on the 15-member NPC, by questioning the authority of the NPC to discuss plans for industrialization. He said on the occasion that the national priority as adopted by the Congress was to restrict and eliminate modern industrialism. The impasse was normalized after Nehru intervened and declared that most members of the NPC felt that large-scale industry ought to be promoted as long as it did not come into conflict with the cottage industries. This was a long-drawn ideological impasse which made it necessary to articulate the Gandhian view of planning via this plan. 2223. The People's Plan. In 1945, yet another plan was formulated by the radical humanist leader M. N. Roy, chairman of the Post-War Reconstruction Committee of Indian Trade Union. The plan was based on Marxist socialism and advocated the need of providing the people with the basic necessities of life. Agricultural and industrial sectors, both were equally highlighted by the plan. Many economists have attributed the socialist leanings in Indian planning to this plan. The common minimum programs of the United Front Government of the mid-90s 20th century, and that of the United Progressive Alliance of 2004 may also be thought to have been inspired from the same plan. Economic reforms with the human face, the slogan with which the economic reforms 24 started in the early 1990s also has the resonance of the People's Plan. The Sarvadeya Plan After the reports of the NPC were published and the government was set to go for the five-year plans, a loan blueprint for the planned development of India was formulated by the famous socialist leader Jayaprakash Narayan, the Sarvadeya Plan published in January 1950. The plan drew its major inspirations from the Gandhian techniques of constructive works by the community and trusteeship as well as the Sarvadeya concept of Acharya Vinoba Bhavi, the eminent Gandhian constructive worker. Major ideas of the plan were highly similar to the Gandhian plan like emphasis on agriculture, agri-based small and cottage industries, self-reliance and almost no dependence on foreign capital and technology, land reforms, self-dependent villages and decentralized participatory form of planning and economic progress, to name the major ones. Some of the acceptable ideas of the plan got their due importance when the Government of India promoted five-year plans. By the early 1960s, Jayaprakash Narayan had become highly critical of the Indian Planning 25 process, especially of its increasing centralizing nature and dilution of people's participation in it. Basically, the very idea of democratic decentralization was disliked by the established power structure, namely, the MLAs, MPs, the bureaucracy and the state-level politicians. This led the Jayaprakash Narayan Committee, 1961, to decide against the centralizing nature of Indian planning. The committee pointed out that after having accepted Panchayati Raj as the agency responsible for planning and execution of plans, there is, no longer any valid reason for continuing the individual allocations subject-wise even to serve as a guide. Quote. Disregarding the humble advice of the committee, central schemes like Small Farmers 2627 Development Agency, SFDA, Drought Prone Area Program, DPAP, Intensive Tribal Development Program, ITDP, Intensive Agricultural District Program, IADP, etc. 
were introduced by the government and were put totally outside the purview of the panchayats. It was only after the 73rd and 74th Amendments effected to the Constitution 1992, that the role of local bodies and their importance in the process of planned development was accepted and the views of Jayaprakash got vindicated. Some area-wise reports. The idea for the need of a planned development of India became more and more popular by the decade of the 1940s. It was under this popular pressure that the government of India started taking some planned actions in this direction. In the 1940s, we see several area-specific reports being published. A Gajal Report on Rural Credit, E. Karagat Report on Agricultural Development, E. Krishnamachari Report on Agricultural Prices, I. V. Saraya Report on Cooperatives, B. A. Series of Reports on Irrigation, Groundwater, Canal, etc. Closing parenthesis. All these reports, though prepared with great care and due scholarship, the government had 28 hardly any zeal to implement the plans on their findings. But independent India was greatly benefited when the planning started covering all these areas of concern. There is no doubt in drawing the conclusion that prior to independence, there was thus a significant measure of agreement in India between the Government of India under the Secretary of State, the Indian National Congress, prominent industrialists and the others on the following principles. I, there should be central planning, in which the state should play an active part, for social and economic development to bring about a rapid rise in the standard of living. 29. E. There should be controls and licensing in order, among other things, to direct investments into the desired channels and ensure equitable distribution. E. While there should be balanced development in all sectors of the economy, the establishment of basic industries was specially important. In this, state-owned and state-managed enterprises have an important role to play. There were, however, differences of approach with regard to the specific fields to be allocated to the public and private sectors. It is highly interesting and important to note that all the above agreements and opinions were reached through an evolutionary manner in the last two decades before independence in the deliberations and exercises regarding the need for economic planning in the country. The plans prepared by the Government of India, the Bombay Plan and other above-discussed plans, except the NPC and the Sarvadeya Plan, suffered from serious limitations. When they were prepared, it was known that transfer of power was to take place quite soon, but the exact form of the future government was not known, the plans consisted largely of proposals of experts, which were not effectively coordinated. They had no social philosophy behind them. With the advent of independence, they became inadequate, though the thinking that had taken place on planning generally and its techniques proved useful for the future. 30 Major Objectives of Planning Planning for India was an instrument to realize the aspirations and dreams of the future. We know that the foundations of future India were not laid in one day. The cherished dream about future India had evolved through a long-drawn process of the entire period of the freedom struggle. These aspirations and goals got their proper places and due importance in the reports of the National Planning Committee NPC, in the deliberations of the Constituent Assembly and finally in the Constitution of India. From the margins of the ripening nationalist movement, as well as taking clues from the Soviet and the French styles of planning, the NPC articulated the objectives of planning in India. The process of planning in India tried to include all the aspirations of the nationalist movement as well as of the future generations. But this will be a highly general comment upon the objectives of planning in India. We need to delve into the specific and objective goals of planning in India to further our discussions. Some of the historic deliberations regarding planning will serve our purpose. I, reviewing the entire situation, in the light of the social philosophy evolved over decades, the Constituent Assembly came to the conclusion that to guide this, revolution of rising expectations into constructive channels, India should make determined efforts through carefully planned large-scale social and economic development and the application of modern scientific and technological improvements, to bring about a rapid and appreciable rise in the standard of living of the people, with the maximum measure of social justice attainable. On the whole it was a call for India becoming a welfare state. This important deliberation does not only call for the necessity of planning for the country, but it also outlines the broader objectives of planning.
31. E. There are three important features included in the constitutional provisions, which pertain to the objectives of planning in the country. A 32. Economic and social planning, is a concurrent subject. Also, while framing the, union, state, and, concurrent, lists, allocating subjects and other provisions, the Constitution vests power in the Union to ensure coordinated development in essential fields of activity, while preserving the initiative and authority of the states in the spheres allotted to them. b. The Constitution includes provisions for promoting cooperation on a voluntary basis between the Union and the states and among states and groups of states in investigation of matters of common interest, in legislative procedures and in administration, thus avoiding the rigidities inherent in federal constitutions Articles 249, 252, 257, 258, 258A, and 312. In other words, the objective is cooperative federalism. C. The Constitution also sets out in broad outline the pattern of the welfare state envisaged and the fundamental principles on which it should rest. These are the major cornerstones of planning and its objectives enshrined in the Constitution that will breed enough union state tussle in coming decades and make it compulsive for the government to resort to reforms with a human face rhetoric. We can see the methodology of planning taking a U-turn in the era of the economic reforms since the early 1990s. E. The government resolution announcing the setting up of the Planning Commission, March 1950, started with a reference to the constitutional provisions bearing on the socio-economic objectives of the Constitution. The Fundamental Rights and the Directive Principles of the Constitution assure every citizen, among other things, adequate means of livelihood, opportunities for employment and a socio-economic order based on justice and equality. Thus, the basic objectives of planning were already given in the provisions of the Constitution of India. These were emphatically stated in the first 533. Year Plan, 1951-56 itself, in the following words, the urge to economic and social change under present conditions comes from the facts of poverty and of inequalities in income, wealth and opportunity. The elimination of poverty cannot obviously, be achieved merely by redistributing existing wealth. Nor can a program aiming only at raising production remove existing inequalities. These two have to be considered together. Dot. 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 IV. The above objectives of planning were time and again emphasized in one form or the other in the coming times. As the second five-year plan, 1956-61, said, the plan has to carry forward the process initiated in the first plan period. It must provide for a larger increase in production, in investment and in employment. Simultaneously, it must accelerate the institutional changes needed to make the economy more dynamic and more progressive in terms no less of social than of economic ends. Quote. B. The same objectives were repeated by the sixth five-year plan, 1980-85, in the following words, the basic task of economic planning in India is to bring about a structural transformation of the economy so as to achieve a high and sustained rate of growth, a progressive improvement in the standard of living of the masses leading to eradication of poverty and unemployment and providing a material base for a self-reliant economy. B. It will be highly needful to inquire about the objectives of planning in the era of the economic reforms initiated in the fiscal 1991-92 as this new economic policy NEP, made the experts and economists to conclude many questionable things about the objectives of planning in the country. A. Uh, the need to shift dependence from wage to self-employment. B. The state is rolling back and the economy is becoming pro-private and sector-wise the social purpose of the planning will be lacking. C. The objectives of planning nearly outlined hitherto have been blurred. D. The promotion of foreign investment will induce the economy into the perils of neo-imperialism, etc. But all the above given doubts were cleared by the forthcoming plans in straightforward words. We may quote from the following plans, for the future economic development, the economy will be more dependent upon private participation and the nature of planning will become more indicative with the major objectives of planning remaining the same. This was announced by the government while launching the economic reforms July 23, 1991, and commencing the eighth five-year plan, 1992-97.
There was no change in the basic objectives of planning even though there was change in instruments of policy, this was announced by the government while announcing the new economic policy, 1991. While the Ninth Plan, 1997 2002, was being launched, it was announced that the goals of planning in India, which were set by Pandaji, have not changed. The Ninth Plan does not attempt to reinvent the wheel. At the same time, the goals and targets this plan attempts to achieve are based on the lessons of experience, including the Eighth Plan. They address today's problems and challenges and try to prepare the nation for tomorrow as well. 34 The six major objectives of planning in India which are as follows, I. Economic growth, sustained increase in the levels of production in the economy is among the foremost objectives of planning in India, which continues till date and will be so in future, without any iota of doubt in it. Finally, a broad consensus looks evolving through the process of planning and crystallizing on 35 E. Poverty alleviation, Poverty alleviation was the most important issue which polarized the members of the NPC as well as the constituent assembly that a highly emphatic decision in favor of a planned economy evolved even before independence. Several programs have been launched in India directing the cause of poverty alleviation by all the governments till date and the process continues even today with more seriousness we see the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, NREGP, being launched. By the UPA government in 2006 by passing an act in the parliament, the matter has started attracting such high political concern. E. Employment generation, providing employment to the poor has been the best tool of economics to alleviate poverty. Thus, this objective of planning in India comes naturally once it commits itself to alleviate poverty. Employment generation in India has been, therefore, part and parcel of the objective of poverty alleviation in India. General programs and schemes have been launched by the governments from time to time in this direction, some based on the wage employment still, others based on self-employment. IV Controlling economic inequality, there were visible economic inequalities in India at the interpersonal as well as at the intrapersonal levels. Economic planning as a tool of checking all kinds of economic disparities and inequalities was an accepted idea by the time India started planning. To fulfill this objective of planning the governments have enacted highly innovative economic policies at times even inviting a tussle with regard to the fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution. Though Indian planning has socio-economic objectives to fulfill, only economic 36 planning was made a part of the planning process technically speaking, and social planning, better called social engineering, was left to the political process. That is why reservation in government jobs and admissions in premier academic institutions, land reforms, promoting inter-caste marriages, etc. do not fall under the purview of the Planning Commission. B. Self-reliance. During the 1930s and 1940s, there was an ardent desire among the nationalists, capitalists and the NPC for making the economy self-reliant in all economic sphere. Self-reliance was defined not as autarky, but as an effort to strike against a subordinate position in the world economy. As Jawaharlal Nehru asserted, self-reliance does not exclude international trade, which should be encouraged but with a view to avoid economic imperialism. India still strives for self-reliance in every field of the economy, as well as serving the realities of higher interdependence in the globalizing world post-World Trade Organization, WTO. 37. B. Modernization. Modernizing the traditional economy was set as a foremost objective of planning. Especially, the agriculture sector of the economy needed an immediate inclusion of modern methods and techniques of farming dairying, etc. Similarly, in education too. India needs to go for inclusion of modern education system. India did not miss the chance of accepting the importance of modern science and technology. As the economy had selected industry as its prime moving force PMF, it was essential to adopt the changing dimensions of science and technology. The major objectives of planning in India are not only broad but open-ended. That is why it hardly needed any change and modification with changing times. It means, after the completion of one plan the objectives for the new plan are automatically set. 
Coming to the composition of the objectives, we may confidently conclude that all the aspirations of the preamble. Directive Principles of the State Policy, 39 The Fundamental Duties and the Fundamental Rights, 38 The Have Got Their Due Place in Waitage. All the aspirations of the nationalists and the freedom fighters look resonating in the very soul of the Indian planning system. The above given objectives of planning got abolished with the Planning Commission. Under the new body, Niti Ayog, a holistic and federal objectives of planning have been set by the Goit. They have been discussed under the subtitle, Niti Ayog at the end of this chapter. Planning Commission. Once the National Planning Committee published its report 1949, there was a firm inclusion of the need for economic and social planning, 40 in the Constitution, the stage was set for the 41 it was in a piecemeal manner only. For 42 formal launching of planning in the country. Though the economy was run on the principles of planning very much after the independence itself formal planning to begin, for the whole economy at the national level, there was a need for a permanent expert body which could take over the responsibility of the whole gamut of planning, i.e. plan formation, resource aspects, implementation and review, as planning is a technical matter. Thus, in March 1950 the Planning Commission, PC, was set up by the government by a cabinet resolution, without resorting to legislation. Important details regarding the composition, legal status, etc. of the PC were as under, I. An extra-constitutional, I. E. Non-constitutional, and non-statutory body, though planning originates from the Constitution there is no reference to the PC in it. 43. E. An advisory body to the Government of India on an array of issues of economic development. E. A. Think tank, on economic development with the Prime Minister as its ex officio. Chairman and with the provision or a deputy chairman. The main function of the deputy chairman was to coordinate the work of the commission. 4445 IV had an open provision for the number of its membership, as many area experts are required by the particular proposed period of planning other than six union cabinet ministers as its ex officio members and a member secretary. The Minister of Planning is already an ex officio member of the PC. 4647 B an autonomous body entitled to form its own views on important issues and place them before the governments. It worked closely with the union and state cabinets and had full knowledge of their policies. Beat was invariably consulted on changes proposed in social and economic policies. To ensure free and full exchange of ideas, the PC had established a convention that it will not give publicity to differences of views between the commission and the union and state governments. Beat linked with the union cabinet at the secretariat level. The PC was part of the cabinet organization and the demand for grants for it was included in the budget demand for the cabinet secretariat. Beat seated at the Yojana Bhavan, the commission had a staff of secretaries and advisors and also a research organization. 48 X. The PC was a technical body with experts and professionals coming from an array of specific areas as per the need of planning of the concerned period. See footnote 42. X. The Commission had executive powers. 49. Functions of the Planning Commission. Though the PC was set up with a definite purpose of planning, nobody knew that it would extend its functions over the entire spectrum of administration in the country. It was described as the economic cabinet of the country as a whole, even encroaching upon the constitutional body like the Finance Commission and not being accountable to the Parliament. Through time it built up a heavy bureaucratic organization which led even Nehru himself to observe, the commission which was a small body of serious thinkers has turned into a government department complete with a crowd of secretaries, directors and of course a big building. Quote. Though the functions of the PC were extended to include timely changes in the planning needs in the reforms era, its functions were announced by the same government order which 50525351 did set up the Planning Commission.
The order says, the planning commission will, I, make an assessment of the material, capital and human resources of the country, including technical personnel, and investigate the possibilities of augmenting such of those resources as are found to be deficient in relation to the nation's requirements, 54, E, formulate a plan for the most effective and balanced utilization of the country's resources, E, on a determination of priorities, define the stages in which the plan should be carried out and propose the allocation of resources for the due completion of each stage, IV, indicate the factors which are tending to retard economic development, and determine the conditions which, in view of the current social and political situation, should be established for the successful execution of the plan, V, determine the nature of the machinery which will be necessary for securing the successful implementation of each stage of the plan in all its aspects, V, appraise from time to time the progress achieved in the execution of each stage of the plan and recommend the adjustments of policy and measures that such appraisal may show to be necessary, and b make such interim or ancillary recommendations as appear to be appropriate either for facilitating the discharge of the duties assigned to it, or on a consideration of the prevailing economic conditions, current policies, measures and development programs, or on an examination of such specific problems as may be referred to it for advice by central or state governments. Quote, with the commencement of the 10th Plan, 2007, the government handed over two new functions to the Planning Commission in 2002, namely, I, to monitor the plan implementation with special reference to the process of economic reforms, with the help of the steering committees. It should be noted here that once the process of economic reforms was initiated in the country early 1990s, there was a diminishing role proposed for the state in the economy in some areas and increased role for the state in some other areas. The redefinition of the state's role in the economy though it was the contemporary thinking worldwide made most of the experts and the business community to conclude as if there will be no role for planning in the economy. The new economic policy NEP, of 1991-92 was a prima facie proposal for the expansion of the market economy in the country. But it was not the case altogether. Planning has not become irrelevant though it needed to search for a new orientation. And it was highly essential that the process of planning keeps its relevance to the bigger and the broader process of economic reforms. This particular new function of the PC must be seen in this light. E. To monitor the progress of various central ministries. It should be noted here that for the first time, the PC went to set the monitorable targets for 10 areas indicating development. The central ministries have been linked to these monitorable targets. The timely performances of the ministries are now monitored by the PC as per its new function. With the inclusion of the above-mentioned two functions in the existing functions, which were already very broad, the PC had emerged as a real supercabinet. Since it was basically the deputy chairman who officiated the general meetings of the commission, he had a high-level say in articulating the direction and the nature of the economic policies. Through the first new function it articulated, the future dimensions of the economic reforms and through the second new function, it influenced the works of the various ministries, ultimately it seems as if the PC had been able to emerge as the real think tank of development in the country. The PC had also been able to influence the economic policies of the states since 2002 in a great way. Though the PC did not make the state plans it was able to influence the 555657 overall economic policies of the states. It had been possible due to the setting of monitorable targets for states for the same development indicators areas as was been set for the center. The states were liable for being monitored by the PC concerning their performances regarding these monitorable targets. This way the central government had started having its say over the state governments via the new functions of the PC. We may conclude that the PC had been able to unify not only the various economic 58 policies of the center, but also those of the states with the help of these two new functions. Earlier, there had always been a lack of congruence among the policies of the various central ministries and the ideas articulated by the PC. An epitaph to the Planning Commission. On January 1, 2015, the government formally abolished the PC by replacing it with the newly created body, the NIDI-IOG.
With this there ended an era in the economic history of independent India. Whether it was better to revive the PC or abolish it has been a matter of much debate among the discipline experts, politicians and the media. The debate, at times, had emotional tones, too. But the government has its own wisdom behind the action, a detailed discussion on it has been included as the last subtopic of this chapter titled, Nidhi Ayog. As an epitaph, to the PC, may be an ode, it will be quite relevant to have an eye on the report of the Independent Evaluation Office, IEO, on the former which was submitted to the Prime Minister Office by late June 2014. As per it, the PC was created in response to the unique challenges faced by a nascent democracy and a fledgling economy, it conceived a top-down approach to planning that envisaged a dynamic central government building up the economic and social order of weak states. The report called the PC in its current form and function a hindrance and not a help to India's development. It further added that it is not easy to reform such a large ossified body and it would be better to replace it with a new body that is needed to assist states in ideas, to provide long-term thinking and to help cross-cutting reforms. Some of the major recommendations of IEO on the PC are as follows. I. The PC be scrapped and replaced with the Reform and Solutions Commission, RSC, which should be staffed with experts with domain knowledge and kept free from any ministerial administrative structure. The new body should have full-time representation of major trade and industry organizations, civil society representatives, academics, etc. So as to capture their concerns and benefit from their expertise in formulating long-term strategy. E. The RSC will perform three main functions. A. Uh, serve as a solutions exchange and repository of ideas that have been successful in different aspects of development in various states and districts, and in other parts of the world. B. Provide ideas for integrated systems reform, and, c. Identify new and emerging challenges and provide solutions to preempt them. e. The current functions of the PC be taken over by other bodies, which are better designed to perform those functions. IV. Since the state governments have better information about local requirements and resources than the central government and central institutions, they should be allowed to identify priorities and implement reforms at the state level, independent of mandatory diktats from the central institutions. B. The task of long-term economic thinking and coordination can be performed by a new body established to act solely as a think tank within the government. B. The Finance Commission be made a permanent body responsible for the allocation of centrally collected revenue to the states and the Finance Ministry be tasked with the division of funds among the various central ministries. The recommendations of the IEO, a brainchild of the PC itself, on the PC were quite surprising, even shocking to few. Whether the new body replacing the PC will be a betterment over the latter and will be able to carve out its desired aims is a matter to be evaluated and analyzed in future. Meanwhile, we can visibly find some of the recommendations of the IEO resonating in the newly created body, the Nidhi Ayog, the replacement for the PC. Note, while a detailed literature has been included on the Nidhi Ayog, in this chapter, the literature on the PC has been left unchanged for ease of understanding and comparative purpose. National Development Council 59 the National Development Council NDC, was set up on August 6, 1952 by a resolution issued from the Cabinet Secretariat. The first plan recommended its formation with a very concise and suitable observation, in a country of the size of India where the states have under the Constitution full autonomy within their own sphere of duties, it is necessary to have a forum such as a national. Development Council at which, from time to time, the Prime Minister of India and the Chief. Ministers of the states can review the working of the plan and of its various aspects. Quote. There were some strong reasons why the NDC was set up, which may be seen as follows. 60. I. The central plans were to be launched in the states and the UTs with the participation of the state-level personnel. The planning commission was not provided with its own implementation staff though the PC was given the responsibility of plan implementation for this purpose. Therefore, the consent and cooperation of these federal units was a must. E. Economic planning as a concept had its origin in the centralized system, I. E. 
Soviet Union. For India, to democratize decentralize the very process of planning was not a lesser task challenge than promoting development itself. Indian planning is rightly said to be a process of trial and error in striking a balance between liberty and progress, central control and private initiative and national planning with local authority. The setting up of the NDC can be considered as a step towards decentralized planning. 61. E. In the constitutional design of the federal rigidities it was necessary to provide the whole planning process a unified outlook. The NDC serves the purpose of diluting the autonomous and rigid federal units of the Union of India. 62. The NDC initially comprised the Prime Minister of India, de facto chairman, the chief. Ministers of all states and the members of the planning commission, replaced by the NIDI. IOG since January 2015. In the first meeting of the NDC held on November 8-9, 1952. Jawaharlal Nehru stated that NDC is, essentially a forum for intimate cooperation between the state governments and the central government for all the tasks of national development. In the words of Nehru, setting up of the NDC may be regarded as one of the most significant steps taken for promoting understanding and consultation between the union and the state. Governments on planning and common economic policies. Considering the recommendations of the Administrative Reforms Commission, the NDC was reconstituted and its functions redefined by a cabinet resolution on October 7, 1967. The reconstituted NDC comprised the Prime Minister, all Union Cabinet Ministers, Chief Ministers of all states and Union territories and the members of the Planning Commission. Delhi. Administration was represented in the Council by the Lieutenant. Governor and the Chief Executive. Councillor, and the remaining union territories by their respective administrators. Other union. Ministers and state ministers may also be invited to participate in the deliberations of the council. In the reconstituted council, the secretary of the planning commission acts as secretary to the NDC and the planning commission was expected to furnish such administrative or other assistance for the work of the council as may be needed. The basic nature, origin and legal status of the Council are similar to the Planning Commission. The revised functions of the NDC are I. 63. E. To consider the proposals formulated for plans at all important stages and accept them. To review the working of the plans from time to time. E. To consider the important questions of social and economic policy affecting national development, and IV. To recommend measures for the achievement of the aims and targets set out in the national plan, including measures to secure the active participation and cooperation of the people, improve the efficiency of the administrative services, ensure the fullest development of the less advanced regions and backward sections of the community and through sacrifices borne equally by all citizens, build up resources for national development. 64. Though the first plan of India was launched before the arrival of the NDC, the body had many meetings before the terminal year of the plan and useful deliberations, almost all, after due consideration were included by the government into the planning process. But after the death of Jawaharlal Nehru, the greatest champion of democratic decentralization in the country the NDC had become a small gathering of only those who had the same vested interests with only the Congress CMs participating in its meetings. The CMs belonging to other political parties usually did not come to its meetings, the government hardly gave any importance to their advice. A phase of tussle between the center and the states started worsening from here onward with a degradation in principles of the cooperative federalism, with every five-year plans which followed. It was only by the mid-1990s that we see the revival of the lost glory of NDC as well as that of the spirit of decentralized planning. This has been possible due to three major reasons, I-65. In the era of economic reforms, with greater dependence on the private capital made it necessary to allow states greater autonomy in economic matters. Once the WTO regime started it became an economic compulsion. E. The enactment of the Constitutional Amendments 73rd and the 74th had made local-level planning a constitutional compulsion. E. And lastly it was the compulsion of coalition politics in the formation of the Union. Government which made the center to favor the states.
As per the major experts on the issue of decentralized planning, the last of the above given three reasons has played the most important role. By 2002, in the area of development planning we find an enhanced level of federal maturity and we see the last three five years plans 10th, 11th and 12th adopted by a consensual support of the NDC members. NDC had its last meeting 57th in December 2012 and since the new policy think tank NITI. IOT was set up has not been assigned any work. It is believed that in coming times it will be either abolished or merged with the NITI. NDC versus GC at the level of composition the NDC and Governing Council GC of the NITI IOG look different in only one way, members of the NITI are not its members while the members of the PC used to be the members of the NDC. Fostering federal cooperation is the core objective for both but the way it was, is done was, is better in case of the GC, as it reaches its decision in absence of the members of the NITI. The opinion of the GC is necessary for the desired functioning of the NITI as the former is an integral part of the latter. This way the GC looks a better body in comparison to the NDC. This rationale gets doubly vetted by the government's belief that the NITI is, state's best friend at the center, the third function of the NITI. Central planning. The plans which are formulated by the central government and financed by it for the implementation at the national level are known as central plans. Over the years, the center has launched three such plans and the governments have maintained continuity in their implementation. The three central plans are, 1. Five-year plans, 2. 20-point program, and 3. Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme. An introductory description of these plans is given as follows, 1. The five-year plans. This is the most important among the central plans and is being continuously implemented one after the other since planning commenced in India. As planning has been a purely political exercise in India, the five-year plans of the country have seen many unstable and critical moments till date. Several new developments related to planning also took place during the years. Given below is a concise summary of the plans as we see their different periods of implementation. First plan the period for this plan was 1951-56. As the economy was facing the problem of large-scale food grains import 1951 and the pressure of price rise, the plan accorded the highest priority to agriculture including irrigation and power projects. About 44.6% of the plan outlay went in favor of the public sector undertakings PSUs. The plan was launched with all the lofty ideas of socio-economic development, which had frustrating outcomes in the following years. Second plan The plan period was 1956-61. The strategy of growth laid emphasis on rapid industrialization with a focus on heavy industries and capital goods. The plan was developed by Professor Mahalanobis. Due to the assumption of a closed economy, shortages of food and capital were felt during this plan. 66. Third plan The plan period was 1961-65. The plan specifically incorporated the development of agriculture as one of the objectives of planning in India besides, for the first times, considering the aim of balanced, regional development. Enough misfortunes awaited this plan, two wars, one with China in 1961-62 and the other 67 with Pakistan in 1965-66 along the Gujarat border and a severe drought-led famine in 1965-66 had to be faced. Due to heavy drain and diversion of funds, this plan utterly failed to meet its targets. Three annual plans The period of the three consecutive annual plans was 1966-69. Though the fourth plan was ready for implementation in 1966, the weak financial situation as well as the low morale after the defeat by China, the government decided to go for an annual plan for 1966-67. Due to the same reasons the government went for another two such plans in the forthcoming years. The broader objectives of these annual plans were inside the design of the Fourth plan which would have been implemented for the period 1966-71 had the financial conditions not worsened by then. 
Some economists as well as the opposition in the parliament called this period as a discontinuity in the planning process, as the plans were supposed to be for a period of five years. They named it a period of plan holiday, i.e., the planning was on a holiday. 68. Fourth plan The plan period was 1969-74. The plan was based on the Gagel strategy with special focus to the ideas of growth with stability and progress towards self-reliance. Droughts in the Indo-Pak War of 1971-72 led the economy to capital diversions creating financial crunch for the plan. The politicization of planning started from this plan, which took serious, populist, design in the coming plans. Frequent double-digit inflations, unreined increase in the fiscal deficits, subsidy-induced higher non-plan expenditures and the first move in the direction of nationalization, and greater control and regulation of the economy were some of the salient features of this plan, which continued unchanged till the early 1990s. The search for political stability at the center converted planning into a tool of real politics with greater and greater centralization, ensuing plan after plan. Fifth plan The plan, 1974-79, has its focus on poverty alleviation and self-reliance. The popular rhetoric of poverty alleviation was sensationalized by the government to the extent of launching a fresh plan, i.e. The 20-point program, 1975, with a marginal importance being given to the objective of growth with stability, one of the major objectives of the fourth plan. The planning process got more politicized. The havocs of hyperinflation led the government 69 to hand over a new function to the Reserve Bank of India to stabilize the inflation, the function which the RBI carries forward even today. A judicious price wage policy was started to check the menace of inflation on the wage earners. This plan saw an increase in the socio-economic and regional disparities despite the many institutional, financial and other measures which were initiated by the government to attend to them. The nationalization policy continued. There was an overall decay in the quality of governance. A nexus of the criminal politician bureaucrat seems to emerge for the first time to hijack the political system. The plan period was badly disturbed by the draconian emergency and a change of the 70 government at the center. The Janata Party came to power with a thumping victory in 1977. As the government of the time had then complete say in the central planning in India, how could the new government continue with the fifth plan of the last government which had still more than one year to reach its completion? The dramatic events related to Indian planning may be seen objectively as given below, I. The Janata government did cut short the fifth plan by a year ahead of its terminal year, i.e., by the fiscal 1977-78, in place of the decided 1978-79. E. A fresh plan, the sixth plan for the period 1978-83 was launched by the new government which called it the Rolling Plan. 71. E. In 1980, there was again a change of government at the center with the return of the Congress which abandoned the sixth plan of the Janata government in the year 1980 itself. I. V. The new government launched a fresh new sixth plan for the period 1980-85. But by the time, two financial years of the Janata government's sixth plan had already been completed. These two years of the plan were adjusted by the Congress government in a highly interesting way. Uh, the first year, I. E. 1978-79 was added to the fifth plan which was cut short by the Janata government to four years. And thus the fifth plan officially became of five years again, 1974-79. B. Now what to do with the second year, I. E. 1979-80. The Congress government announced this year to be a year of one annual plan. This annual plan, 1979-80, may be considered the lone independent remnant of the rolling plan of the Janata government.
the sixth plan, 1978-83, which could not become an official plan of India had emphasis on some of the highly new economic ideas and ideals with almost a complete note of foreign investment, new thrust on price control, rejuvenation of the public distribution system, PDS, emphasis on small-scale and cottage industries, new lease of life to Panchayati Raj institutions pre-I. E. The second phase of the revival of the pre-agriculture and the subject of rural development getting the due, etc., being the major ones. Sixth plan This plan, 1980-85, was launched with the slogan of, Gary B. Hadow, alleviate poverty. Already, a program, the TPP, was tested and tried by the same government in the Fifth plan which tried to improve the standard of living of the poor masses with the direct approach, the idea of poverty alleviation, but such a slogan of, Gary B. Hatow, was not given to the program. The plan gave emphasis on socio-economic infrastructure in the rural areas, eliminating rural 72-73 poverty and regional disparities through the IRDP, commencing, target group, approach together with launching a number of national-level programs and schemes aimed at specific concerns and areas of development, target group, approach. 74. Seventh plan The plan, 1985-90, emphasized on rapid food grain production, increased employment creation and productivity in general. The basic tenets of planning, I. E. Growth, modernization, self-reliance and social justice remained as the guiding principles. The Jawahar Rojgar Yojana, JRY, was launched in 1989 with the motive to create wage employment for the rural poor. Some of the already existing programs, such as the IRDP, CADP, DPAP and the DDP were reoriented. Till date, the government has been evaluating the achievements of all the developmental 75 programs, courtesy the youngest PM of India. Somehow, democracy and development got connected with a major change in the thinking of the political elite, which decided to go in for democratic decentralization to promote development. It laid strong foundations for itself as the constitutional amendments, the 73rd and 74th were possible by the early 1990s. Though the economy had better growth rates throughout the 1980s, especially in the latter half, yet it was at the cost of bitter fiscal imbalances. By the end of the plan, India had a highly unfavorable balance of payments situation. Heavy foreign loans on which the governmental expenditures depended heavily during the period, the economy failed to service. The plan was not laid with a strong financial strategy, which put the economy into a crisis of unsustainable balance of payments and fiscal deficits. 76-77 India basically tried to attend its growth prospects by commercial and other external borrowings on hard terms, which the economy failed to sustain. In the process of liberalization, an expansion of internal demand for the home market was permitted without generating equitable levels of exports and ultimately Indian imports were financed by the costly external borrowings. Such an, inward-looking, fiscal policy proved to be a mistake when the external aid environment for the economy was deteriorating. 78. Two annual plans The eighth plan, whose term would have been 1990-95, could not take off due to the, fast-changing political situation at the center. The pathbreaking and restructuring-oriented suggestions of the Eighth Plan, the sweeping economic reforms ensuing around the world, as well as the fiscal imbalances of the late 1980s were the other important reasons for the 79. Delay in the launch of the Eighth Plan The new government, which assumed power at the center in June 1991, decided to commence the Eighth Plan for the period 1992-97 and that the fiscals 1990-91 and 1991-92 should be treated as two separate annual plans. The two consecutive annual plans 1990-92 were formulated within the framework of the approach to the Eighth Plan, 1990-95, with the basic thrust on maximization of employment and social transformation. Eighth Plan The Eighth Plan, 1992-97, was launched in a typically new economic environment.
The economic reforms were already started, in July 1991, with the initiation of the structural adjustment and macro-stabilization policies necessitated by the worsening balance of payments, higher fiscal deficit and unsustainable rate of inflation. This was the first plan which went on for an introspection of the macroeconomic policies which the country had been pursuing for many decades. The major concerns and pathbreaking suggestions which this plan articulated may be summarized as follows, I, an immediate redefinition of the state's role in the economy was suggested, E, 80 feet market-based, development advised in areas which could afford it, I, E. A greater role for the private sector in the economy, 81, e, more investment in the infrastructure sector, especially in the laggard states as the ongoing emphasis on greater private sector investment could not be attracted towards these states, iv, rising non-plan expenditure and fiscal deficits need to be checked, v, subsidies need restructuring and refocusing, v, planning immediately needs to be, decentralized, v, special emphasis on, cooperative federalism, suggested, v, greater focus on, agriculture, and other, rural activities, was suggested for which the plan cited empirical evidences as they encouraged the economy to achieve enhanced standard of living for its people and to promote the cause of balanced growth, a shift in the mindset of planning. As the economy moved towards liberalization, criticism came from every quarter against the move. The process of planning was also criticized on the following counts, I. As economy moves towards the market economy, the planning becomes, irrelevant, e, when the state is, rolling back, planning makes no sense, e. The planning process should be, restructured, in the era of liberalization, and, i.v., there should be increased thrust on the, social sector, i. e. Education, healthcare, etc. Closing parenthesis. Ninth Plan The Ninth Plan, 1997-2002, was launched when there was an all-round, slowdown, in the economy led by the Southeast Asian Financial Crisis, 1996-97. Though the liberalization process was still criticized, the economy was very much out of the fiscal imbroglio of the early 1990s. With a general nature of, indicative planning, the plan not only did target an ambitious high growth rate, 7%, but also tried to direct itself towards time-bound, social, objectives. There was an emphasis on the seven identified basic minimum services BMS, with additional central assistance for these services with a view to obtaining complete coverage of the population in a time-bound manner. The BMS included, 82. I. Safe drinking water, E. Primary health service, E. Universalization of primary education, I. V. Public housing assistance to the shelter less poor families, V. Nutritional support to children, V. Connectivity of all villages and habitations, and V. Streamlining of the public distribution system. The issue of fiscal consolidation became a top priority of the governments for the first time, which had its focus on the following related issues, I, sharp reduction in the revenue deficit of the government, including center, states and the PSUs through a combination of improved revenue collections and control of inessential expenditures, 83, E, cutting down subsidies, collection of user charges on economic services, I, E, electricity, transportation, etc. Cutting down interest, wages, pension, PF, etc., e. Decentralization of planning and implementation through greater reliance on states and the pre. Tenth Plan The Plan 2007 commenced with the objectives of greater participation of the NDC in their formulation. Some highly important steps were taken during the plan, which undoubtedly points out a change in the planning policy mindset of the government, major ones being, i, doubling per capita income in 10 years, e, accepting that the higher growth rates are not the only objective, it should be translated into improving the quality of life of the people, 84, e, for the first time the plan went to set the, monitorable targets, for 11 select indicators of development for the center as well as for the states, IV governance, was considered a factor of development, V states role in planning to be increased with the greater involvement of the pre, V policy and institutional reforms in each sector, I, E.
reforms in the PSUs, legal reforms, administrative reforms, labor reforms, etc., be agriculture sector declared as the prime moving force PMF of the economy, be increased emphasis on the social sector, I. E. Education, health, etc. X. Relevance between the processes of economic reforms and planning emphasized, etc. 11th plan The plan targets a growth rate of 10% and emphasizes the idea of inclusive growth. In the approach paper, the Planning Commission shows its concerns regarding realizing the growth targets on account of the compulsions towards the fiscal responsibility and budget. Management Act In recent times some aberrations in the economy have started to increase the government's concerns in meeting the plan target of 10% growth. The major concerns are, i.a. higher inflation, above 6%, led to the tightening of the credit policy forcing lower investment in the economy, which will lower production. e. A stronger rupee is making export earnings shrink fast. e. Costlier food grains and other primary articles playing havoc for the poor masses. i.v. Costlier oil prices becoming a burden for the national exchequer, etc. Not only the government but the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, as well as the world. Bank expressed doubts in the 11th plan realizing the ambitious 10% growth. 85. 12th plan The draft approach paper of the 12th plan 2012-17 was prepared by the Planning Commission after widest consultation till date, recognizing the fact that citizens are now better informed and also keen to engage. Over 950 civil society organizations across the country provided inputs, business associations, including those representing small enterprises have been consulted, modern electronic and social media, Google Hangout were used to enable citizens to give suggestions. All state governments, as well as local representative institutions and unions, have been consulted through five regional consultations. Though the Approach paper for the plan was approved by the NDC by mid-2011, the plan document was finalized much later after the launch of the plan, like the 10th and 11th plans. The draft approach paper lays down the major targets of the plan, the key challenges in meeting them, and the broad approach that must be followed to achieve the stated objectives which are summed up as follows, a growth rate of 9% is targeted for the plan. However, in view of the uncertainties in the global economy and the challenges in the domestic economy, the approach paper indicates that it could be achieved only if some difficult decisions are taken. E. It emphasizes the need to intensify efforts to have 4% average growth in the agriculture sector during the planned period, with food grains growing at about 2% per year and non-food grains notably, horticulture, livestock, dairying, poultry and fisheries growing at 5-6%. E. The higher growth in agriculture would not only provide broad-based income benefits to the rural population but also help restrain inflationary pressure, which could arise if high levels of growth are attempted without corresponding growth in domestic food production capabilities. IV. It proposes that the major flagship programs which were instrumental for promoting inclusiveness in the 11th plan should continue in the 12th plan, there is a need to focus on issues of implementation and governance to improve their effectiveness. B. The plan indicates that the energy needs of rapid growth will pose a major challenge since these requirements have to be met in an environment where domestic energy prices are constrained and world energy prices are high and likely to rise further. B. For the GDP to grow at 9%, commercial energy supplies will have to grow at a rate between 6, 5 and 7% per year. Since India's domestic energy supplies are limited, dependence upon imports will increase. Import dependence in the case of petroleum has always been high and is projected to be 80% in the 12th plan. B. Even in the case of coal, import dependence is projected to increase as the growth of thermal generation will require coal supplies, which cannot be fully met from domestic mines. B. It suggests the need to take steps to reduce energy intensity of production processes. Increase domestic energy supply as quickly as possible and ensure rational energy pricing that will help achieve both objectives, viz. Reduced energy intensity of production process and enhance domestic energy supply, even though it may seem difficult to attempt.
Hicks, it draws attention to evolving a holistic water management policy aiming at more efficient conservation of water and also in water use efficiency, particularly in the field of agriculture. X. It argues that a new legislation for land acquisition is necessary, which strikes an appropriate balance between the need for fair compensation to those whose land is acquired and whose livelihood is disrupted, and the need to ensure that land acquisition does not become an impossible impediment to meeting our needs for infrastructure development, industrial expansion and urbanization. She, it maintains that health, education and skill development will continue to be the focus areas in the 12th plan, and that there is a need to ensure adequate resources to these sectors, universal health care, proposed by it, emphatically. Simultaneously, it also points to the need to ensure maximum efficiency in terms of outcomes for the resources allocated to these sectors. The need to harness private investment in these sectors has also been emphasized by the approach. She, it takes cognizance of the fact that achieving 9% growth will require large investments in infrastructure sector development, notes greater momentum to public investment and public-private partnerships PPPs in infrastructure sector needs to be imparted so that present infrastructure shortages can be addressed early. She, it has emphasized the importance of the process of fiscal correction. However, the paper cautions that fiscal consolidation would imply the total resources available for the plan in the short run will be limited. Resource limitations imply the need to prioritize carefully and that some priority areas, e.g. health, education and infrastructure will have to be funded more than others. Civ, it also emphasizes the need for focusing more on efficient use of available resources in view of the resource constraints. The appraisal document for the 12th plan, prepared by the NIDI IOG estimated a growth rate of maximum 7. 75%. Taking clues from the plans the document made a strong case for clear tax policies and focus on manufacturing sector. 2. 20-point program. The 20-point program, TPP, is the second central plan which was launched in July 1975. The program was conceived for coordinated and intensive monitoring of a number of schemes implemented by the central and the state governments. The basic objective was of improving the quality of life of the people, especially of those living below the poverty line. Under this, a thrust was given to schemes relating to poverty alleviation, employment generation in rural areas, housing, education, family welfare and health, protection of environment and many other schemes having a bearing on the quality of life in rural areas. The program was restructured in 1982 and 1986. The program, known as the TPP-86, has 119 items grouped into 20 points which are related to the improvement in the quality of life in rural areas. Among the total items, 54 are monitored on the basis of evaluatory criteria, 65 against preset physical targets and rest of the 20 important items on monthly basis. The targets are fixed by the ministries at the center in consultation with the states and the UTs. The allocation for the program is done under the various five-year plans. The TPP-86 was restructured and named TPP-2006 feet keeping in view the challenges of the 21st century with particular reference to the process of economic reforms. This was in harmony with the National Common Minimum Program NCMP, of the UPA government. This was the first program which had direct attack approach on rural poverty. The forthcoming five-year plan, i.e. the sixth plan, 1980-85, launched with the slogan, Gary B. Hatow, was based on the experiences of the TPP, a right mix of economics and real politic. Over the years, the program has been implemented uninterrupted by all political parties which came to power at the center. By mid-2015, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, MOSPI, which monitors the program, in a report to the Prime Minister's office, had advised to wrap it up as it has outlived its utility. While the PMO decided to restructure it on the recommendations of the Interministerial Group, which is presently working on it, it should be noted that the 
Government has restructured the existing 50 centrally sponsored schemes CSSs, into 30 under the active participation of the Governing Council of the Niti Ayog. 3. MPLADS The Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme MPLADS, is the last of the central plans and latest to have been launched. 2. The scheme was launched on December 23, 1993 with only 5 lakh rupees given to each MPs which was increased to 1 crore rupees in the year 1994-95. When the MPs did put a demand to increase the sum to 5 crore rupees in 1997-98, finally the government enhanced it to 2 crore rupees since 1998-99. In April 2011 the corpus was enhanced to 5 crore rupees while announcing the new guidelines for the scheme. Basically, in the early 1990s there came a demand from the MPs cutting across party lines for such a scheme so that the fruits of development could directly reach the masses via their representatives. The government of the time decided to go in for such a scheme and the MPLADS came. Under this scheme the members of Parliament 86 recommend some works I. E. Creation of fixed community assets, based on locally felt developmental needs to the concerned district. Magistrate. The scheme is governed by a set of guidelines, which have been comprehensively revised and issued in November 2005. Its performance has improved due to proactive policy initiatives, focus monitoring and review. In recent years, many criticisms of the scheme came to the public notice, which concerned 87 either misappropriation of the funds or non-use of the funds, especially from the backward states. The people's representative at the PRI level have been demanding scrapping of the scheme as it infringes the idea of decentralized planning. In its place, they want the funds to be given to the local bodies directly for the same kind of work specified by the MPLADS. In May 2014, MOSPI issued the revised guidelines for the scheme which is simple, clear and 88 understandable to all concerned. The fine points of the guidelines are as given below. I. It provides not only the list of prohibited items under the scheme, but also that of permissible items. E. In order to encourage trusts and societies to work for the betterment of tribal people, the ceiling of 50 lakh rupees, stipulated for building assets by trusts and societies in areas occupied by tribals, has been enhanced to 75 lakh rupees. E. Further, to promote cooperative movement and rural development, the cooperative. Societies have also been made eligible under the MPLAD scheme. IV. The abandoned or suspended MPLAD work to be completed by the states. B. Natural and man-made calamities can also be allocated funds under it. B. Now the funds can be allocated by MP outside of constituency, state, UTs, too. B. It can converge with the other approved central, like MGNAREGA, and state. Government schemes. B funds from local bodies can be pooled with MPLADS works. X public and community contribution is made permissible in the scheme. X1 MP1 idea, an annual competition for best innovation in solving local problems. She, a proper mechanism for its implementation and auditing have also been put in place. To provide MPs a greater choice under the scheme, the list of indicative and illustrative shelf of projects has been expanded touching the fields of infrastructure development, drinking water, education, roads, health, sanitation, natural calamity, etc. The scheme has been given more dynamism and flexibility. Multi-level planning. It was by the late 1950s and early 1960s that the states demanded the right to plan at the state level. By the mid-1960s, the states were given the power to plan by the center, advising them that they should promote planning at the lower levels of the administrative strata, 2, I. E. At the district level planning, via the municipalities and corporations in the urban areas and via block level through panchayats and the tribal boards. By the early 1980s, India was a country of multi-level planning, MLP, with the structure and strata of planning as follows. First strata. Center level planning. At this level three types of central plans had evolved over the years, the five-year plans, the 20-point program and the MPLADS. Second strata. 
State Level Planning By the 1960s, the states were planning at the state level with their respective planning bodies, the state planning boards with the respective CMs being their de facto chairman. The plans of the states were for a term of five years and parallel to the concerned five-year plans of the center. Third strata, district level planning. By the late 1960s all the districts of the states were having their own plans with their respective district planning boards with the respective district magistrate being the de facto chairman. The district level plans are implemented now via municipalities or corporations in the urban 89. Areas in the panchayats via the blocks in the rural areas. Fourth strata, block level planning. As a part of the district level planning the block level planning came up which had the district. Planning boards is their nodal body. Below the blocks, India developed the planning at the local level, too. Fifth strata, local level planning. By the early 1980s, plans were being implemented at the local level via the blocks and had the District Planning Boards DPBs, as the nodal agency. Due to socio-economic differentiations among the population, local level planning in India developed with its three variants, namely, I, village level planning, E, hill area planning, E, tribal area planning. Basically, the MLP was started to promote the process of decentralized planning in the 90 country. It was the Indian version of democratic planning which ultimately sought to guarantee the people's participation in the process of planning. But it failed to do so due to many reasons. The reasons have been discussed below, I. It could not promote people's participation in the formation of the various plans. The basic idea of the MLP model was that once the local level plans will be handed over to the blocks, the blocks will make their plans and once the blocks hand over their plans to the districts, the district level plans will be formulated. Similarly, the state plans and finally the five-year plan if the center will formulate one. By doing so, every idea of planning will have the representation of everybody in the country at the time of plan formation, a special kind of plan empathy would have developed out of this process. But this was not the reality. Every strata made their own plans, lacking the empathy factor. The only central plans were implemented as the states lacked the required level of finance to support the plans. They ultimately had to be satisfied by implementing the central plans which failed to include the state's empathy. E. As the local bodies in India were not having any constitutional mandate, they just played the complementary roles to the state planning process. As they had no financial independence, their plans, even if they were formulated, remained only on paper. IV. The MLP, thus, failed to include the people's participation in planning, badly betraying the local aspirations. 91. But at least the failure of MLP made the government to think in the direction of decentralized planning afresh leading to the enactment of the two important constitutional amendments, the 73rd and 74th. Way to decentralize planning.